Okay, so welcome to the homotopy type theory electronic seminar talks. I hope everyone's enjoying their fall weather or maybe spring weather depending where you are or maybe even summer or winter weather depending when you are watching this video. Uh, anyway, I'm very pleased to introduce Anders Schmertberg from Stockholm University and the title of this talk is Unifying Cubicle Models of Homotopy Type Theory. So take it away please. Right. Thank you, Dan, and thanks to both Dan and Chris for inviting me to give this talk and for organizing this great series um, of talks. And, all right, so like Dan said, please uh, feel free to ask me questions whenever something is unclear, and I'll try to monitor the chat, but yeah, it's not so easy to, to see it while staring at my other screen. All right, so... This talk is about some recent work I've done with uh, Evan Cavallo and Andrew Swan about unifying cubicle models of, of hot. And so, as many of you know, there's quite a zoo of cubicle models so far. So, for example, the PCH model, CCHM model, ABC FHL, and so on. And so, if you don't know what these models are, I'll introduce more or less all of them today and then explain how they are related. And the answer to this is through a new, yet another cubicle model, but uh, which generalizes most of these, these uh, earlier cubicle models. And we have a paper about this that you can read if you're interested in all the details. And right, so maybe I should say, so most of uh, these models, so it's, uh, it will be clear later, but the PCH model and so far the equivariant cubes are not yet covered by our generalizations, but that's there's still some room for future work. Okay. Mm. Right. So in this talk, I'll use the convention that univalent type theory is just your favorite flavor of material type theory, so dependent type theory with univalence axiom or univalence principle. And uh, I'll use homotopy type theory to mean that type theory, but with some higher inductive types. Okay. And we all know that univalent type theory has a model in constant visual sets, which was originally proved by Grobotsky and later written up by Chris and Peter. And uh, when people started analyzing this model, they found out that it's um, inherently classical in the sense that it's using classical logic in kind of crucial ways. Um, the a natural question was how to make this, this model constructive, and this was the original problem that motivated the use of these cubicle methods that we'll be talking about today. All right, so, so these cubicle methods have led to a lot of interesting new developments. Uh, so for example, is cubicle type theories that I'll talk a bit about today. And uh, then building on this type theory, so these are type theories that incorporate some of the, the structure of the cubicle models. And building on this, we've implemented a variety of proof assistants with native support for all the features of hot, so univalence and various schemas for higher inductive types. So for example, there is now a cubicle version of Agda that you can just, so if you download the latest version of Agda and write minus minus cubicle of in the top of your file, you can use one of these cubicle type theories and do all kinds of cool things with higher inductive types and univalence. Okay, and uh, another nice thing is that these um, cubicle type theories typically satisfy some form of canonicity, which means that uh, any term of type natural number reduces to a numeral, any term in a closed context uh, reduces to a numeral. And uh, this then implies that the, the theory is consistent and so on. So it gives kind of alternative consistency results for the hot. And they've also played some role in the recent uh, proof of homotopy canonicity for hot. Uh, that uh, of um, Chris Kapulkin and um, uh, Christian Satter. Right. And also, because these models are developed in a constructive meta theory, so for example, the uh, CZF, it's, uh, the theory has lower proof theoretic strength than ZFC, 
So we get some analysis of the proof theoretic strength of the invariance axioms through this models, and also write of independence results that I'll mention later. And also, uh, well, and then working in this, this cubicle proof assistance, we can do a lot of the results from hot and synthetic homotopy theory in kind of more direct ways uh, as well. So, so these cubicle methods have somehow uh, played a very big role in hot in the last few years. All right, so in this talk, I'll give an overview of the various cubicle models and then discuss our generalization. And finally, uh, if there's time, also discuss how we get a model structure from our cubicle set model. And our generalization is expressed in the internal language of a locally conditioned closed category, extended with some axioms following the, the style of uh, Orton and Pitts. And it, we have formalized more or less, well, most of it in Agda, so we still haven't formalized the, the universe construction and uh, the model structure. But so there's some room for future work there as well. Right, so before I start talking about the cubicle models, I'm just gonna point out some an interesting observation about the, how these cubicle models uh, are de have been developed compared to the simplicial set model. So, so in the original simplicial set model, um, Vladimir started with the, the model structure, on, so the equivalent model structure on simplicial sets, and used that to construct a model of homotopy type theory, or univalent type theory, and what then has happened is that um, we have um, developed this. So these cubicle models don't use much language from the theory of model structures at all. Instead, um, we first construct the model, and then from the model, we obtain a model structure. And this construction of the model structure there um, crucially uses um, this, this uh, fact that we have vibrant universes in the cubicle models. I'll talk more about this later. Okay, and so, yeah, I see some chat here, but uh, oh, okay. I hope that can mute them. Yeah, I, All right. I, I think you can ignore it. Just some people are noticing a bit of echo, and we were trying to figure out if it was wrong. Right. Um, but I, I don't think there's any settings we have that we can change. Okay, well, I hope you all can hear me reasonably well. Right. So yeah. So that, so then the model structure that we get through this uh, from from the cubicle model is also constructive, which is a, also another different compared to the model structure on simplicial sets, the classical one. Okay. So let me start with the part one. Um, cubicle models of thought. Right. So this goes back to the the first breakthrough, which was when the uh, Norpil Sam theory components in Hoover realized that you can one can construct a constructive model of you know, type theory using some variation of cubicle sets. So they use uh, sort of substructural and cubicle sets. So I'll explain what those are, are later. And this gave the first constructive model of, of univalent you know, type theory, which is typically referred to as the BCH model after the first letter of the last name of the authors. Paper. Can I quickly ask a question? Yes. Uh, Who's asking? It, it's me. I don't know. Uh, you know the model structure that you were talking about on the previous slide. What category is that on? Um, right. So these cubicle models, they're typically some some pre shift category on some cube category, right? And so what we do is we construct the model structure on this this pre shift category. That answer your question? Okay. Whoever you ask. I'll get back to it later as well. So hopefully it will be, be clear. Okay. Well, thanks for asking a question. It's just good uh, not to know that I'm just talking to my screen. Okay, so right. So like I just said, uh, so this this was a pre-shift model on some cube category, so uh group category out of Category up into set. Um, most of the other cubicle set models are also pre categories, but we vary the 
the underlying cube category, and I'll also discuss some other parameters that you can vary when constructing these models. Okay, so after the BCH model, um, we constructed another model based on kind of structural cubicle sets with a lot more structure, so the connections and reversals. And uh, this was then written up more or less exactly four years ago by uh, Cyril Cohen, Thierry Consim, Huber, and myself. And we show that we get a model in so called the Morgan Kahn cubicle sets, which is now referred to as the CCHM model. And in the same paper, we also developed a cubicle type theory based on this model, in which we can prove and compute with the univalence theorem. So there's a, there's a term interpretive inhabiting uh, this type, okay, which then means that univalence has <coughs> computational content in this theory. Right. And well, in parallel with what we were doing in Sweden, many people at CU in Pittsburgh were working on models based on Cartesian cubicle sets. And one reason for considering those cubes instead is that they have some nice properties compared to the, the CCHM cubes. For example, the, the size of the home sets is a lot smaller and some other interesting properties. Okay. And then uh, the, right, so the tricky thing, when so the hardest part when constructing these models is to prove that we have univalent universes that are closed under all the type formers. And the, the key idea for how to do this in the Cartesian setting was found by Fabio and Dewey, Fabioni and Bob Harper in 2017, when they were working on a computational version of the Cartesian type theory, which then led to um, a paper with three more authors, so the ABC FHL paper and the ABC FHL model, which gives a, a model of univalent type theory uh, in Cartesian cubicle sets. Okay, so that's the ABC FHL model. And then, right, yet another model was constructed by Teichi Remura in so-called cubicle assemblies. And this, this model is uh, interesting because it has an impredicative univalent universe, and uh, Teichi used it to prove um, some independence results, for example, independence of a form of composition over sizing, and Andrew Swan and Peichi also prove uh, independence of church thesis um, using this, this kind of model. Okay, so that's just an overview of some of the, the cubicle models that we've seen in the last, last four years, five years, I guess, four, six. Okay, so then, um, well, yeah, so we also need to, to, to model hot, we also need to model our inductive types. And as we know, they are types generated by point and higher path constructors, like the, the circle or the suspension. And um, we can add this axiomatically to hot, like it's done in the hot book. And this is justified semantically in uh, some kind of sufficiently nice model categories, for example, concentration sets. And this was proved by Peter Lamson and Mark Schumann, 2017. And um, uh, we've also proved that the, most of these cubicle set models also support higher inductive types. So, for example, uh, for the De Morgan cubes that we used in the CCHM model, we in the paper we also shown showed. So, in the CCHM paper, we showed that uh, these models, the spheres, that the, this model supports the spheres and propositional truncation. And then a few years later, we also extended this to a much larger class of, of hits, including pushouts, and everything you can construct from pushouts and so on. And for Cartesian cubes, this was worked out by Evan Cavallo and Bob Harper. Now, interestingly, for the BCH model, uh, it is in fact not even known whether it supports the, the circle. And uh, this has to do with the fact that the path type is modeled by some kind of linear exponential. Um, which causes troubles for interpreting the eliminator of the circle, other higher inductive types. Okay. Now, right, so our construction in this CHM paper um, was then analyzed and generalized so that it applies to, for example, cubicle assemblies by Andrew Swan and Peichi Mura in their paper about Church's thesis. So, most of these cubicle set models uh, model hot, so Invalence axiom and our inductive types. And well, we now have 
bunch of cubic contact theories inspired by these models. And so let me talk a bit about cubic contact theory now. Um, all right. So what makes a type theory cubical? Well, the first thing we do is to add a, a formal interval i, called i, uh, which two distinguish endpoints, 0 and 1, and some interval variables. And then we extend the context to also include this kind of interval variables. So not just normal variables, but also interval things can be in the context. And, uh, the, and then you can make kind of a nice um, uh, dictionary between kind of the proof theory of these uh, interval contexts and the semantics in cubical sets. So, for example, if you have so substituting zero or one, so epsilon stands for zero or one, uh, for some i in the context corresponds to um, a face map in the model. So, so, if you have some type over this context and you pull it back along this, you, you substitute epsilon for i. Weakening corresponds to degeneracy. Exchange corresponds to rotating cubes. And contraction corresponds to taking the diagonal of a cube. Okay. So there's this nice correspondence between cubical type theory and uh, the cubical models. Okay. And the various cubical set models, uh, they support uh, different morphisms like this. So for example, the uh, right. So, so all of the cubical set models have uh, that we consider have face maps, degeneracies, and exchange. But for example, BCH does not have contraction, so that's what makes it into a substructural theory. Okay. While the Cartesian models, like uh, well, the ABCFHM model and the CCHM model, are both Partition, well, uh, uh, sorry, both have contraction or diagonals, and this makes them into a structural, like a basis for a structural type theory. So, make it, that makes them easier to use as a basis for cubical type theory. Than I, under, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I'm starting to hear some of the echoing that other people were mentioning. Oh. Is the mic? Uh, sorry, is the speaker off on your second device? Let me double check. Sorry. Ah, that might. Oh, well, it's off. Okay, that was the only other idea I had. We yeah, already, everything. I've already checked that everyone's microphone's muted. Yeah. Okay, we can we can still hear you. It's good. just that there's a little bit of sort of a whistling noise in the background that I can hear. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, definitely muted. Right. Um, okay. Can I ask a quick yeah. question? If yes. I remember correctly, these uh, the identity types or the path types that you come up with in the cubicle type theories, they should be equivalent to the identity types you get from Martin Love type theory, right? Mm hmm. Well, right, so that's kind of a subtle issue. So there, that's kind of a subtle point. So these path types that you get by, by just mapping out of the interval in cubical type theory don't satisfy the computation rule for the eliminator. So the mapping of so J you eliminator. You can't derive the J rule, is that what you mean? No, you can derive the J rule, but the computation rule will only hold up to a path, not judgmentally or definitionally. Okay, but you can then fix this by introducing identity types um, through a variety of techniques. Uh, so you can recover the, the identity types from the path types, but by default, the, the path type does not satisfy this computation rule definition, of it. but it satisfies it up to a path. So, yeah. All right. Hope that was clear. Okay, and then well, yeah, so to explain this, the CCHM model and some other of these models, uh, I'll talk about some additional structure we can assume on the intervals. For example, we can assume this and in all operations uh, that 
are typically called connections. We can also have some kind of negation operation. And if we have all these and they satisfy the axioms of the Morgan algebra, then we get the CCHM model. If we only have uh, these two, the, the connections, and they satisfy the axioms of a distributive, lat distributive lattice, then uh, we get the so-called Dedekin model. And one can also get away with kind of a weaker set of axioms for this corresponding to what's called a connection algebra, and then one gets the so-called program bits model. And uh, yeah, so there is a lot of kind of room in varying the, the cubicle set, uh, the, the underlying cubicle sets on which you take the free shapes when constructing these models. And this is one reason why we get so many different models. But, uh, but this is not the only parameter that we can tweak. So we can also, we also need to equip all types of so-called can operations, which intuitively says that any open box can be filled. So this corresponds to the, the horn filling conditioning can signature sets, hence the name can. And uh, so these are added through some scary looking typing rule like this. I'm not going to go into the details, but the idea is you specify a subset of uh, i cos i, so rs, and then you add operations of the form com r to s. And these operations then let you fill open boxes in some sense. And semantically, this corresponds to, to uh, making a trace of some form of vibration structure, specifying what the vibrations are in the model. Okay. And, well, the different models have different uh, RS sets. Uh, and yeah, I'll explain more about this very soon. And another parameter is the shape of open boxes. So uh, there's some room in, in changing the shape of an open box, which kind of open boxes we can fill. So can we specify some of the diagonal of boxes or not, and so on. And semantically, this corresponds to specifying the generating curve vibrations in the model. And uh, typically, these are classified by maps into this phi. And we pick phi to be some sub of omega, or maybe all of omega if we want. Okay, and the crucial idea in this AFH, uh, so the, yeah, I'm usually probably a Harper paper, to get the univalent universes to work in the Cartesian model was to include this diagonal co-vibrations. And this is some way of specifying the diagonal of a cube or a box that you're filling. And semantically this corresponds to including the diagonal map to generate the co-vibration. Okay. Right, so let me, let me summarize this with a table. So uh, we have these six different models, and only the BCH model is not structural. We have different operations on the interval, satisfying different axioms in the different models. And depending on the choice we do here, we need to have different structure, so different RS pairs. So for example, in the CCHM model, because we have this reversal operation, we only need to have 0, 1 pairs. We can uh, compose from, from the, end, the beginning of a line to the end of a line, essentially. But if we drop this negation operation, then we also need to be able to compose from the end to the beginning, and so on. And if we drop all of this structure, as in the Cartesian models, then we need to include all RS pairs. And uh, yeah, so on. And then to get to prove that this operation here is closed under, so that you so, so that you have univalent universes in the Cartesian model, they also needed to assume this diagonal co-vibration structure. But this is only assumed in this this model. So a natural thing to do to to generalize all of this would be to try to drop this diagonal co-vibration. Uh, from this model, but uh, then the, the algorithm, well, the, the proof that the universe is univalent and fiber breaks down, so you need to do something more. And this is what we, we figured out how to do. Uh, so we managed to do the Cartesian cubicle set model without diagonal co vibrations. And the key idea is to not require the, a, a certain strictness condition when this r is equal to s. So when you're going from r to r, 
in the Cartesian model, this has to be the identity function. But uh, we, we figured out that you actually don't require it to be strictly equal to the identity function, but just up to a path. Right, so let me talk more about this now. So how do we get this to work? So like I said earlier, so we present our generalization in the internal language of, of some cubicle set topos uh, following Orton Pitts. So we had a, a paper from 2017 where they um, formulate some axioms for modeling cubicle type theory in a topos. And we're picking kind of a subset of these axioms and vary them a bit in order to present our generalization. And for this kind of internal language model to support univalence, uh, univalent universes, we also rely on a paper by Daniel Kata, and if it's uh, best fitters, but internal universes in models of homotopy type theory. And, uh, and so far, we've only, uh, so we've used Agda to formalize most of the model, but not yet the, this internal universe construction. But instead, we just apply their theorem on paper. But it would be nice to, to complete the formalization. Okay. So, right. So, so now I'll explain how, how we do our model construction in this open pit style. And in fact, nothing that we do uh, rely on um, the suburb classifiers. So we instead generalize and work in some. The internal language of a local equation plus category C. So this means we're working in some form of extensional type theory. And we do the following. So we assume a bunch of uh, axioms essentially. So we assume that we have an integral, that we have a type of so called co fiber propositions. We define a notion of vibration structure and prove that it's closed under all the type formers that we want. So pi sigma and path types. And then we do the hardest part, which is to define the univalent vibrant universes of vibrant types and prove that it's closed under these, these type formers. And then finally, we prove that um, this model gives rise to a model structure. And as I've already said, so these two last steps are not yet internalized or formalized, but only on paper so far. Right. So let's see how we add the interval. So this axiomatization is we assume that we have an integral uh, in the internal universe. So we assume the meta level that we have a, a hierarchy of, of uh, quantum universes. And uh, this is essentially the yeah, internal version of such a universe. In some sense. Okay, then we, we omit the, the, the universe levels and so on for readability here. So anyway, so we have an integral type. And it has two endpoints, so and one. And we assume two axioms. So the first axiom essentially says that the, the interval is connected. And the second axiom says that the two endpoints are distinct. So nothing too Can surprising. You ask, did you say you have an interval in each universe or just in the bottom one? And they get kind of lifted up. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, we, we have it in the bottom one. Yeah. I think I'll have to check the Agda code. So all the code is online, so you can look it up while I'm speaking. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's in the in the lowest universe. Let's see why we would put it anywhere higher. Anyway. Okay. Thanks for the question. Right. So this is all we all we assume for the interval that is to axiom so that it's connected and that the endpoints are distinct. Nothing too controversial. Then we have this type of code fiber propositions. And so we're using kind of a universal Aptarsky of these code fiber propositions. We assume a type phi and some decoding function into prop. And together with four operations. So we have a map from the interval into this, this type of code fiber proposition. So one map is squiggly equals zero and the other one is squiggly equals one and this represents some of the, the endpoints of, of a line essentially. And then we can take the, the join of two such things. So for example, i equals zero or i equals one corresponds to the two endpoints of a line. 
just to... Then we have some kind of formal operation uh, that I won't talk so much about. Okay. And now this, uh, this type has to satisfy some axioms as well. So the first one just says that the decoding of this squiggly equality is really the, the normal equality in this extensional type theory. Okay, and same for one. And the decoding of this internal or, or of this assumed or operation is the, the, the squashed sigma type, essentially. Uh, sorry, some type of these two types. So, and then we need a technical axiom six that I won't really talk about, but it's used to strictify so called blue types. So, this is just taken directly from logic bits. And then we need that the decoding of this for all operation is really the, the function space, uh, the dependent function space of the type theory. Okay. Now, uh, right, so now we've kind of set up the basic all well, the integral and the code for the propositions and all the axioms we need. And now we can start working in this model. And the first thing to do is to define a notion of vibrations, so the vibration structure. And for that, I'll need to talk a bit about partial elements. So a partial element of a type A is a term that is only defined on the extent of a, of a phi. So there's some kind of function out of the extent of phi. And we also need to define a extension relations, we say that x extends f if whenever f is defined, it's equal to x. And then we also write, uh, so this is kind of a type which whenever phi is true, it is equal to f. Uh, so, right, so the inhabitants of this type are all equal to f whenever uh, phi it's true or, yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's true. Right, and then we need some kind of other operation. But it's not so important. Okay, so now we can define this complicated uh, notion of weak composition structure. So given some input like this, so we have a um, type of partial paths corresponding to kind of the sides of our box. And we have this X zero that corresponds to the base of the box. This just says that whenever phi is true, this x0 agrees with the sides, so but it's a kind of a connected box. And the weak composition structure is then given by two operations. So W comb operation that kind of gives us the, the lid or the filler of this open box, and the output agrees uh, with the size of the box uh, whenever phi is true. And now this is kind of the key idea is this underlying w com or the w com path as we call it. So if we instantiate uh, R for S, then we somehow get an operation from uh, that in the Cartesian model would have been definitionally equal to X0 or the first projection of X0, but here it's only equal up to a path. So this is kind of the, the crucial weakening that we needed to do to to get rid of the diagonal propagations. Okay, and then we also need to satisfy a, another technical condition, but this is this operation is really the, the key new idea here. And we can then package this up. So a weak vibration A alpha over gamma, so A is a type of the gamma, uh, together with a vibration structure, so so alpha as type is fib A, which is this kind of complicated thing packaging up all the data we have so far. Okay, so let me just give an example because this is probably uh, too abstract if you haven't seen this kind of stuff before. So, um, right, so given some terms U0 and U1, uh, the, so U0 is defined when J is squiggly to zero and U1 is when J is one, together with some x0, uh, which is defined when i is equal to some r, where r is some arbitrary point in the interval. So, uh, so the input looks kind of like this. So we're given the u0 and u1 constitutes kind of the, the sides of our open box, the generalized open box, and x0 is the base, but um, 
the base is somehow this funny handle now, and it is glued onto uh, the size at this point R in the below. And the operations, so the W from operation then gives us the, the basis here, so the, the stripe lines here, so the filler, and the W compat then gives us this gray stuff that relates X0 to uh, the W from, from R to R. So you can write some nice notations that are hopefully more readable and understandable if you know the CCHM notations. So, so W com. So this this output here is really the results of doing W com from R to I uh, with this system of constraints starting from X zero, and we also have this W com path that gives us a path from W com R to R to X zero. Right. And for those of you who are more semantically minded, we can also see this as some kind of lifting diagram like this. So we're given a, a lifting problem where this is some kind of uh, open box in A, and we can extend this to the whole of this shape. Okay. So that's essentially what is going on semantically. <coughs> Okay, let me take some water and let you stare at this for a while. Okay, so, right, so now we have our integral, our type of cofibrant composition, and some kind of notion of vibration structure. We then need to prove that this vibration structure is closed under type formers, and for that we use the first five axioms that you probably have forgotten by now, but um, Essentially, we don't need the two complicated axioms yet, uh, with, but this notion of vibration is closed in the signal flying path. Um, it's natural numbers, support to natural numbers if um, the category has a natural number subject. And uh, the proof of these things are kind of straightforward adaptations of the proofs in the ABC FHL, in the FH model, AFH models, uh, but we somehow need to be careful to compensate for the weakness of the fact that this um, this uh, this equation only up, holds up to a, a path and not definition of it. So you need to do some additional corrections here and there to compensate for that. But it turns out you can prove you can make everything work with this weaker notion. Okay, so now uh, we come to the most Complicated parts. So yeah, I'm. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. So. Um, so to construct this, uh, to construct univariant and fibered universes um, that are close under those type formers, we need to use this axiom six. Uh, and for this, we just follow Ort and Pitts kind of blindly, and just do exactly what they do. And then we use XM7 to prove that these blue types that we construct are vibrant. And this is by far the most complicated part. And there, uh, yeah, we refer you to the formalization if you're interested. We also have a note where we write down the proof, and you can see it's, yeah, longer than all the other closure things we prove by far. So it's really. The hardest part in the construction. And semantically, this approach points to the so called equivalence extension property, which says that equivalences between vibrations is extended on co vibrations. Yeah. And then finally, we apply locks, and which their main theorem is essentially that if the interval is tiny, so that this means that exponentiating by it has a magical right adjoint, then we construct. A universe U with a vibration L that is classifying in some technical sense their theorem. Uh, yeah, and you can look up the details if you're curious. Right. So, okay, so to get back to, I, I think it was Ali who asked me about identity types and path types. So, we've checked uh, that we can construct identity types, so path types. Where, well, yeah, types where the 
computation rule for the eliminator holds definitionally. Uh, and we did, we formulate three different constructions uh, this, so there are many different ways of doing it right now. And we also check that we have, we can support parametric types by essentially adapting the, the cavallo harper proof for partition cubicle sets. Uh, right. Okay, I'm doing pretty well on time. Um, so, yeah, so to sum this up, so we get a class of models of homotopy type theory based on uh, Cartesian cubicle sets with these weak vibrations uh, without using very local vibrations, which was our original goal. Now we might wonder what the relationship is to the other models, and I've already said that uh, this model generalizes them, so we can just quickly state in which sense. So we can define internally also a notion of AFH or ABCFHL vibrations, just like they do in their paper. And if we also assume these diagonal curve vibrations, which uh, essentially is, which involves assuming another operation on the, uh, yeah, that takes two integral variables and gives you something like phi, and uh, that decodes to the equality between two elements of, of the integral. So if you assume this, then we can prove that we have a vibration in this sense, if and only if we have a vibration in our weak sense. Uh, furthermore, so we can also, yeah, just open up work and pits and define a notion of CCHF vibration. And then if we assume a connection algebra, which is essentially that we have these meet and join operations on the interval, satisfying some mild assumptions about how they interact with the endpoints. And uh, then we can prove that um, A is a CCHM vibration if and only if it's a vibration in our weak sense. So our weak notion really generalized both the Cartesian and CCHM models um, in the presence of this additional structure that they let one has in the, their respective models. Okay, so let me summarize with the table with one more line. So uh, we achieved what we set off to do. So we have a structural model without any uh, additional operations on the interval. With some kind of can operation from R to S that are weak in the sense that I've explained without the identical operations. And interestingly, we also, by just kind of instantiating our uh, axiomatization, we also get a cubicle assemblies model without connections and diagonal co vibrations, uh, generalizing this cubicle assemblies model of Tenchi or Nura. Okay, so I uh, have about 15 minutes left to talk about the final part. <laughs> so, right, so then now we have all these cubicle set models of what? And the question is, that one might wonder is which of these uh, give rise to model structures, right? So these are pre categories. We can ask if there's a class of, of cubic vibrations. Uh, well, of, well, if there's a class of co vibrations, vibrations are weak equivalences, so let's find the well, normal axioms of a model structure. Okay. And the vibrations that we we choose should correspond to this kind of operations that we have in the model. So somehow, uh, yeah, so there should be a, this kind of close connection between what we do in the, the type theory and the model with this, with this structure. So what we do is we, we look up a paper by Christian Sattler, where he has a general construction of model structures uh, on certain pre-shift categories with some additional structure using ideas from the CCHM model. So in particular, he's using uh, the fact that the universe is vibrant to uh, prove the two out of three properties for equivalences. And then this theorem directly gives model structures for all the cubicle set models uh, with connections. And one can also generalize it to the Cartesian setting uh, with diagonal co vibrations. So it seems kind of natural now that we have a, a cubicle set model, a Cartesian cubicle set model without diagonal co vibrations, it's kind of 
yeah, doesn't seem too surprising that we also put a model structure for this theorem, but some work is necessary to actually make sure that all of these constructions work in our so, Okay. Right. So like I just said, we, we also use Christian's theorem to get our model structure from the position to the model without matrix entirely perfect. Okay. And right, so for those of you who don't know model structures, so you um, essentially you need to do three things. So you need to construct the quality of well we so we do algebraic weak characterization systems. Uh, uh, yeah, so you need to have two of these and then uh, some extra stuff you need to check. Okay. Right, so let me explain how we do this. Mm, okay, so so for the first factorization system, we observe that this cofactor proposition, so the decoding function corresponds to a mono like this, uh, out of well, this is essentially just first projection out of a sigma type of the the phi's that are that decodes to one to so to the true phi's in big phi. Okay. Then we just said that a map in our category. Uh, it's a generating code vibration if it is a pullback of this map. Okay, so, uh, nothing too surprising. And then, uh, through some general uh, results and a variation of the small logarith argument, we, we get our first weak factorization system. So, uh, the details are, yeah, so we have a note where we write up the details of all of this. So, I'll look there after the talk. Curious. Right. And then for the more interesting trivial code vibration, vibration factorization system, we need to use the, the map into cylinder factorization. So we write, so L of M is the map into the cylinder factor, map and cylinder factorization of our map M, and our map is the map out of it. And this is definable as a suitable push out in the standard fact. Okay. And then the key theorem that we prove is that F is a weak vibration in the internal sense, if and only if it has the right, drift, the right lifting property against um, a map like this in a size category. And this map is the, to so use this L of the diagonal map, push our product with this, uh, this uh, with, a, with a T map, or top map. Okay, so. Uh, this is essentially what, so if you remember my, my, yeah, let's go back, so, but essentially this specifies the kind of the open boxes that we have are given by this, and then the map is in the right class if it lifts against this kind of open box inclusions of this form. Okay. And we also use a version of the small only determinant to get to the this uses of factorization, a weak factorization system. And then finally, oh no, not finally. So um, one interesting thing I can say about this uh, this notion of vibration is that we, um, and related to a notion of weak left lifting property, so we say that M from A to B has the weak left lifting property against F if uh, we have a normal situation like this, but the upper triangle only commutes up the homotopy. Um, this is apparently a notion that has been studied in homotopy theory in the past. And yeah, we kind of reuse it in our proofs to, to prove certain things because F is a weak vibration if essentially um, this kind of condition holds. I, I won't attempt to go into it, but uh, what it really kind of says some R has the weak left lifting property against uh, the uh, pullback home. Of from B star of M against uh, an F. So, so there's kind of a correspondence between F being a weak vibration and this weak left lifting property. That's useful when improving properties about these weak vibrations. Okay, so right. And then we apply Satter's theorem, which we have to adapt a little bit to make it work in our setting. And we end up with a full model structure as. As promised, and we stated the theorem this way. So, suppose that we have a local equation post category satisfying our axioms 1 to 5, uh, where every vibration is used small for some universe of small vibrations, with the underlying object U is vibrant, 
And then given that to characterization systems, I just quick characterization system I just quickly discussed. Uh, then uh, we get a model structure determined by the both vibration C and the vibration C. Okay. Now, uh, right, so just as we saw that uh, the CCHM model and the, the Cartesian model were special cases of our, our new, new model. Uh, we also get the similar results for the model structures. Oops, go the wrong way. So uh, one can show that the, both the co-fibrations and vibrations that we get in our model structure coincide with the ones in the other model structures obtained, for example, from the, the, the CCHM model and from the Cartesian model uh, when we assume appropriate additional structure. So this also generalizes things on the, the homotopical side of things. Yes. Okay, so well, I'm on time, and let me just summarize this a bit. So we constructed a model of fault uh, that generalizes uh, most of the earlier cubicle set models, except for the PCH model, and uh, we formalized most of it in Agda, and we managed to adapt Cetris, uh, so Christian's model structure construction to our general setting. And well, future work, as I've said a few times already, we want to formalize the universe construction and also the construction of the model structure in an extension of Agda called Agda flat. Uh, so you need some kind of flat modality to construct this universe and also to construct the model structure internally. And then it's obviously an interesting question whether we can also uh, modify things so that BCH is a special case of so it fits into this general framework, and it's technically hard to do that. Um, yeah, so it's unclear whether the BCH model is really different in some, some yeah, inherent way, or whether it can fit into some even more general generalization. Okay, and then of course the, the standard question is whether uh, these model structures that we construct how they are related to the standard, so the equivalent one. On, so the classical one, I should say, standard classic model structure and concept vision sets. Um, right, and there's been some recent work on, on a so-called equivariant cubicle set model, which, which is in fact uh, equivalent to the, the concept vision set sets. So, and this equivariant model is not a special case of our our um, construction yet, but it might be possible to get that to work. That might be easier than um, getting um, things to work for BCH. Okay, that's it. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Anders. That was really interesting. Um, like we started doing last time, we're going to applaud visually uh, with microphones muted just because we had some trouble with, with mics after applause. So let's all thank Anders. Can watch everyone cheering for you. Thank you. All right, and now we'll uh, open the floor to questions. We've got plenty of time, so just unmute your mic if you want to ask a question. Well, I'll start with one. Um, so your talk was mostly about the the semantic side, the models. Um, what would you mm -hmm. say about how this might influence uh, a cubicle type theory itself and whether it might make proof assistance um, you know, different in some way, easier to use, or how will it affect that side of things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so because things are, are weaker in this, this, uh, with these con operations that we have, um, the proofs that uh, these, these vibrations are, are close in the types, for example, it's a bit more complicated, which in turn would make a cubicle type theory based on this a uh, bit harder to use and also more inefficient than the ones we have. So, so this model shouldn't be, I don't think we should design a cubicle type theory based on this model. Um, but on the other hand, it is interesting to have this generalization also for, for 
the factory is because one could use it to prove some form of um, homotopic canonicity result for this uh, cubic type theory, which would then mean that all of this, uh, everything you do, like all the computations you do in the different special cubic type theories would coincide. So a priori, if I write down a term in, in CCHM, cubic type theory, if I plot and I run it, I might get the number one, while in the Cartesian model I get uh, in the Cartesian cubic type theory, I get the number two. So one could make sure that we always these models compute the same uh, in a suitable sense. Uh, so, but yeah, I don't think this model uh, should be seen as a, as a way to make cubical type theories any better. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. Um, so you, I think you said that most of this has been done in Agda. Is there any um, thoughts about being done in uh, other uh, languages such as Kotlin or anything like that. Right. So that's, um, yeah, that should be mostly possible, I guess. Um, so one thing, well, the part we haven't done is hard to do in both uh, uh, and Lean. So this thing about um, Agda flat. So Agda now has this well, the flat modality, and as far as I know, neither Koch nor Lean has that, so, so that part we couldn't do, but I think everything we've done, you could do with both uh, Koch and Lean. And I know that, um, yeah, Simon Boulier has uh, formalized similar models and also model structure constructions uh, in, in Koch. So, so we could definitely do everything that doesn't require either flat, I would say. Next question. I'm sure, someone's dying to ask a question. <laughs> Mute your mic and go ahead. That was so crystal clear. <laughs> I can ask. I can ask a question. Um, hey, go ahead. So, I in with um, Andre's talk from last time, where we were talking about general type theories. Um, so actually, uh, Andre was mentioning Taichi's um, work on general type theories as well. Right. And that um, does cover cubic type theory. Mm -hmm. um, does this? Still hold true. Uh, what do you mean? Um, for your generalization, does that still fit into um, Wimura's framework? Um, right. So I haven't looked at his paper, that paper of his, closely. So it's kind of hard to say. But I would be, I would be surprised if this, this. Uh, so if you would design a cubic type theory based on this model that we have, which I just said you shouldn't, then. Um, I would assume that it fits into his framework. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. there's really like not really much new on the type theory side of things going on. So but it's not something that you've looked at. Uh, no, no. Okay. Not yet. Okay. Right. Okay. Other questions? Okay, last call. All right, well, if there aren't any more, then we will uh, visually thank Andres again. And I will Thanks, let you Joe. know that our next talk is by Andrew Swan in two weeks. Um, and I hope to see you then. Okay, thanks. <laughs>